Tom, you've always been recognized as an expert in election law. Tell us about uh, Jim Hare. Well, Jim Hare was a Secretary of State. Uh, Jim uh, ran for governor. He and Swainson and Ed Connor did. And Jim uh, just didn't make it. Swainson did. Zoltan Ferenc had uh, uh, maneuvered for uh, Swainson very much. Jim ran a good Secretary of State's office. He was the first one to put driver's licenses on computers. I think it may have been one of the first in the states to do that. He came out for uh, seat belts and so on. So he was a good straight administrator. How about uh, some of his staff, Bernie Apel? Bernie Apel is proud. Bernie's a, you've known Bernie well. I've known Bernie for I don't know how many years. We've been to conferences in India. I never knew if he voted Democrat or Republican. But Bernie was highly respected. He, uh, he ran a good straight ship, and uh, he was very, uh, very, I think he was a little too strict on uh, declaring some ballots, on, you know, ruling things out, but he did it equally, and he, uh, he was very, and he's still alive. I see him every now and then, and we're at our CONCON reunions. Speaking of CONCON, let's uh, shift to that topic. What, uh, what caused you to decide to run as a delegate? To oh, the I kind of liked the idea. Uh, I was on the fringe of the legislative operation. My name had been suggested to be one of the 21 from Detroit. I was kind of neutral. And it really was a, would be a creative experience. And writing the Constitution is much conceptually much broader than deciding the gas tax should be one cent more, one cent less, something like that. And uh, I think it was just kind of an interest in government and uh, well, kind of wanted a new experience. You ran from uh, the 4th House District, uh, which at the time was one of these multi-member districts. Right. Tell us about that campaign. Yeah, that's an interesting one. The district was uh, two-thirds African-American, one-third white. So I teamed up with Father Cannon Dade, who was a black minister, and Daisy Elliott, who was very active in the Trade Union Leadership Council. That was a leading organization of active uh, labor people, uh, Negroes. Later on, they let some of us whites in. And the three of us campaigned together very well, and I learned a lot in that campaign. Uh, uh, Can and Dade, in particular, get me into black churches. And I began to really understand the impact and the basis that black church had that here were people often discriminated against all week, and then Sunday was their day. And it was a tremendous learning experience for me. Of course, I and, and then Daisy Elliott got me into the Trade Union Leadership Committee meetings. I got them into a lot of meetings like unions that were predominantly white. So the three of us campaigned very strongly together, and all three made it. Now, the district right next to mine was two-thirds white and one-third Afro-American. There, Dick Austin, who's the latest Secretary of State, ran with two white uh, college professors, Mel Nord and uh, uh, Harold uh, Norris. And all six of us made it, and all six worked together very closely. The, the election of those delegates to the Constitutional Convention were done under the current state legislative redistricting plan, which obviously favored the Republicans. Yeah. Uh, but you found that when you counted up the number of delegates, there were about two to one Republican yes. uh, to, to Democrats. Uh, you were chosen uh, by the Democrats to serve as uh, a vice president of the Constitutional well, it Convention. Well, wasn't, it wasn't quite that simple. The one thing, in fact, I'd raised the question with Gus and even with Ted Sachs whether we should challenge the CONCON because it wasn't based on the one person, one vote. Well, the, the time just wasn't ripe, and I agree with that. Then what I wanted to see was that we didn't have the Republicans dominate and pick all the committees. So I started putting out press releases saying that we should get one-third and be able to pick our one-third. Well, then the fellow elected president was Steve Nesbitt. And uh, I also took the position, the Democrats agreed that the Republicans had won, they should pick the president, and we shouldn't get involved. There were, oh, some rumors that we would have uh, try to be the balance of power and so on because, let's see, the biggest fight was Steve Nesbitt, George Romney, John Hanna, I think Ed Hutchison, a lot of Republicans were vying for that. And I think Steve was absolutely the best choice. Well then, to follow that two to one, I hadn't thought of it for a vice, vice president, 
uh, Steve was the one, and others said, well, look, if we keep that two to one ratio, there should be three vice presidents. And Steve had known me from the United Way. I'd been on committees with him, and uh, he'd asked me if I were interested, and you know, the caucus was, you know, no objection to it. So he, uh, so Ed Hutchins and Romney and I were the vice presidents. The Republicans couldn't decide whether George or Ed would be first vice president, so we were all equal vice presidents. So I got equity, equity so with them. So you a troika. A troika, that's right, yeah. Now, Steve Nesbitt was a, an executive with Gerber's? Yes. He was a very gentle person. I said he didn't have a mean bone in his body. He just had the ability to keep things glued. I know he was very concerned that about night sessions. Some of the delegates were real old, maybe 60 years old, and he didn't want them staying up too late. And he's just a very thoughtful, kind person. Tom, Ed Hutchinson, one of the other vice presidents of the convention, went on to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives and served uh, as the ranking Republican on judiciary during uh, impeachment. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, an interesting story. He and I took the same course in social legislation at the University of Michigan. And the professor teaching, he'd raise a question, ask Ed for the answer, ask me for the answer, and then tell the students the real answer somewhere in between. <laughs> but uh, Ed and I got to become very good friends. We had uh, one of our CONCON -con reunions, and I said, well, as time went on, I told that story. I said I came to realize that well, once in a while it might have been Ed was right and even more rarely that I was wrong. Well, people cracked up and I remembered after uh, one of the Con Con reunions, he came over to the house here and we had a very pleasant time. Now, during the, when he was senator, he was in that group that said uh, Williams is going to be defeated, don't okay any Democrats. He was on the Committee on Confirmation I don't say he voted against me, but he didn't really push for me. But he would, after about three and a half years, uh, go along and let it through. So Ed was a very honest conservative. Uh, he was, from, I think, Allegan County. And he, uh, he was a very, very straight arrow. Uh, he came by his feelings very strongly. And, uh, and uh, he and I, we, 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 we could talk to each other. We didn't convince each other, but we could talk. We listened. And that leaves us with George Romney. Well, George is a, is a fascinating person. There was supposed to be an oral history done on him, and I had offered to, but we thought somebody that knew him better, you know, would be better. And I've never learned too much about the impact of his being driven out of the United States, his family. You know, the Mormons were driven into Mexico. And I think that must have had a tremendous impact on him. To, can imagine yourself being driven out of your native, your home and going to a country at a different language and culture. And I've never, you know, and in fact, if I'd done the oral history on him, I'd have asked that. Well, I think there are two things George Romney did that were tremendous. The one was he came out against the gas guzzler and had the small car, and he had a little dinosaur on his lapel. The second thing was he said he was brainwashed on Vietnam, and that may have knocked him out of the chance to be president. I don't think it, he'd have made president, but I, uh, what's really amazing to me that here's George Romney, high school, no college, went to Vietnam. He first recognized he was brainwashed, then he had the guts to say he was. And I think that took a tremendous amount of courage because I think he knew that that wouldn't be I mean, as politically astute as he was, it wouldn't be politically popular. In fact, I uh, was looking at the McNamara Mia Culpa book. I looked in the index, and Romney isn't even mentioned. Well, there was McNamara, uh, was it Harvard or Yale graduate, one of the best and the brightest, one of the wise men advising uh, Johnson, and it took him 25 years to realize what George Romney realized right away. And I, I think, in fact, some of this populist going on in the country of, well, Ginrich and Army were graduates, not of Harvard or Yale, some backwater colleges. But I think there's a mood in the country that, that maybe the, the George Romneys and the Gus Scholes had better political insight than the, the McNamara's and so on. So I think those things he should be given a lot of credit for. 